This is the F-22. This is the F-35. This is the Tempest. This is the FKAS. This is the KF-21. This is the AMCA. This is the J-20. And this one is the J-31. Did you notice anything? Of course they did. It is an easy spot. I of course certainly did, sir. <laughs> Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. Please stay with me till the end, because the stuff that we're going to discuss here, as usual, is not easy to find anywhere else on YouTube. You may have noticed that all the latest generation fighters, either in service or being designed, all look alike. And the reason is simple. Stealth killed aerodynamics. What I mean by this is that the stealth requirement is forcing a specific geometry on the aircraft. If geometry is constrained, then the number of available aerodynamic solutions is greatly reduced. If geometry is constrained, all planes will look the same. However, the evolution of stealth design somewhat limited these constraints and the penalty of modern designs is not as severe as it used to be. The F-117 had flat surfaces and angular shapes because the calculation of the radar reflections was executed on a punch card computer. Today, computer simulation and finite element modeling allow for less tough compromises. But still, the design of a stealth plane is clearly recognizable. There are two classes of solutions for radar stealth, radar absorbing materials and geometric stealth, with the second being the main contributor. Otis, would you be so kind to explain to our viewers? Thank you, sir, for letting me cover such a cutting edge subject, sir. Radar stealth is based on the principle of reducing the radar energy reflected back toward the radar receiver. The radar equation is the following, where PR equals peak received power by the emitting radar, PT equals peak transmitter power, GT equals emission gain, sigma equals radar cross section, A equals effective area of receiving antenna. The peak received power is the parameter that influences the detection of the target. Stealth purpose is to minimize the peak received power. This is obtained by reducing the radar cross-section. The radar cross-section, in square meters, measures the fraction of reflected energy and compares it to the energy reflected by a square metallic plate. The radar cross-section is a property of the aircraft, and it varies with the aircraft aspect. Radar cross-section reduction methodology hash one absorbed the radiation. The aircraft structure is coated with paint or a layer of material that absorbs the radar radiation. This is obtained by adding metal inclusions that either reflect the radiation onto each other or resonate with the radiation frequency. In both cases part of the incident energy is dissipated. No practical radar absorbing material can absorb 100% of the radiation. Actual absorption is quite low, in the region of 10% to 15% of the impinning energy. Radar cross-section reduction methodology hash to scatter the radiation. The aircraft shape is such that the radar radiation is scattered toward directions different from the provenance. This methodology can achieve high radar cross-section reductions but for a limited range of directions or aircraft aspects. For operational purposes, the most important aspect in terms of radar cross-section reduction occurs at zero degree roll, zero degree pitch and zero degree yaw. It is usually represented in a polar diagram that shows the radar cross-section in respect to the orientation of the axis of symmetry of the aircraft. Sir. Thank you, Otis. Well done. Otis explained how stealth depends on shape. Since radars are usually far from the target, you may consider that the radar beam is basically horizontal, so you may want to scatter the radiation up and down. Horizontally, you may want to scatter the radiation sideways because moving toward or running away from a target is when you really want to be less visible. On a stealth plane, you will never find a vertical wall just because they reflect the radiation strike back to the emitter. 
the edge on the frontal part of the fuselage like this or this scatters the radiation away as if it was a mirror because the wavelength of the impinging radiation is small if compared to the dimension of the surfaces involved. Radar radiation can be assimilated to light reflecting off the metal. For the same reason, sidewalls are usually not vertical and the tails are canted outwards. Another element that you won't find on a stealth plane is 90 degrees angles. A 90 degrees angle has the property of always reflecting back the radiation toward the direction where it came from, which is exactly what you don't want. This is the reason why external stores are so harmful to stealth. The pylons under the wing are vertical and they are also 90 degrees with the wing. Also, canards are not particularly stealthy because they form an angle with the fuselage which is usually close to 90 degrees. Classic wedge intakes like this are, yes, of course, very efficient but definitely not stealthy because of all those 90 degrees angles. On stealth planes, the air intake tend to be an irregular lozenge to deflect the radiation away from the direction of provenance. The wing platform is more varied than the fuselage, but still there are some common traits. Wing edges, leading and trailing, are often parallel to a couple of directions. In this way, radiation is reflected toward a couple of directions rather than in multiple directions. Actually, all the edges in a stealth design tend to be aligned so all the reflections are all parallel. In the reflection of those directions, the return will be strong, so potentially a radar could pick up the stealth plane uh, at distances comparable with a normal plane. But the receiver would need to be located in a different position than the emitter. This is called a bistatic radar. This is definitely not something new. The first radars ever built were bistatic radars, but this is forcing a further complexity onto the enemy defenses. There are several other effects to be considered other than specular reflection, like creeping waves, uh, edge diffractions and structural resonances. But this may be the subject of another video because these do not impose a specific structural constraint to the plane. So Sir. This video is too short, sir. <laughs> Don't worry, uh, there is another chapter. Be quiet now. Since stealth favors clean-cut lines, uh, we have lost some of the features that used to be very important in aircraft design. For example, the area rule is hardly compatible with stealth, because it requires smooth variation of surfaces. Hence, in general, the transonic performance of stealth plane could be better, everything else equal. On the upper surface of the plane, which is less likely to receive radar radiation, some shaping can be done, but otherwise the planes tend to be rather blocky. The other lost element is the variety in wing platforms. There was already an evolution toward delta wings, which is inherently a rather good stealth platform, but modern stealth is actually enforcing the use of suboptimal platforms. They can do very well, better than you may expect, because today, again, with computational fluid dynamics, it is possible to fine-tune them, optimize them for the various flight conditions. Still, they may not be, and in general they are not, the best from an aerodynamic point of view. I know I will be unpopular, but today the most efficient aerodynamics can be found on the Sukhoi 27 family. On the Sukhoi 27, the wing and the lifting body are optimized for speeds ranging from 0.7 to 0.8 Mach to 1.2 to 1. 3 Mach, which is the range speed which is most used in practice and in combat. 
If we compare the Sukhoi 35 with the F-22, the two aircrafts have roughly the same takeoff weight, roughly the same maximum speed, if the data available are correct. But the Sukhoi 35 has 25% less dry thrust and 10% less afterburner thrust than the F-22. The F-22 achieves its remarkably outstanding performance by brute force rather than by aerodynamic finesse, like the Sukhoi 35. And this is sort of sad. So let's do a quick recap of the principles of radar stealth in case you haven't seen the video we have just dedicated to this subject and the link is in the cards and in the description below. To reduce the detection probability of a radar, what you want to minimize is the power of the reflected signal toward the radar itself. There are two main methodologies to do this. One is radar absorbing materials, they reduce the energy bouncing off the surface that they are covering by simply absorbing part of it. Two is the reduction of the specular reflections toward the emitter, which is normally obtained with the typical shapes that you see on stealth. When we have applied these two principles, we have done already a quite good job, but still there's quite a long way to go. The reason being that, according to the radar equation, the power received is inversely proportional to the fourth power of the distance between the emitter and the target, and directly proportional to the radar cross-section. I remind myself that the radar cross-section is a measure of how good or bad is an aircraft or any other object at reflecting uh, the radar energy. It is a property of the object itself. The lower the radar cross-section, the lower is the energy reflected toward the emitter. If the probability of detection decreases with the fourth power of the distance, it means that even a small reduction in radar cross-sections will do wonders at long distance. But the flip side is that when you get close to the target, also the probability of interception increases with the fourth power. So if you want to gain the last mile of stealth, that is, if you want to be stealth being quite close to the emitter, then you need a drastic reduction of radar cross-section. Basically, if the detection probability drops quickly with distance, it also rises quickly if you reduce the distance. Sir, that wasn't very rigorous, sir. Okay, Otis, do you think you can do better? I certainly can, sir, but I will not. I have other business to attend, sir. Great. Specular reflection is typically the largest component of the reflected energy, but there are at least three other effects that produce a radar return. The surface wave return, the creeping wave return, and diffraction. The surface wave happens on a conductive component, like a antenna rod or a metal plate, when it is excited by the impinging radar radiation. The element behaves like a transmission line till a discontinuity is encountered or the wave gets to the edge of the component. In this case a non-directional radiation is emitted and the wave bounces back toward uh, the other side of the component until the process is repeated. Obviously at some point if it's not continuously excited by new radar radiation actually impinging on the plane, obviously the wave will dissipate. The creeping wave happens when the surface wave that we have already seen actually travels along a circular element of the aircraft. For example, one of the panels or the elements composing um, an external uh, drop tank. 
While the wave travels around its circular path, it emits radiation in every direction, including the direction where it came from. Another function of the edge that is so characteristic of the front section of stealth aircraft is also to stop the creeping wave from circulating all around the, the fuselage of the aircraft. Another reason why external stores do compromise stealth is because they are often cylindrical. External fuel tanks, uh, weapons of any kind, they tend to be cylindrical and built with uh, separate cylindrical elements that don't stop the creeping wave from propagating. Diffraction happens at sharp edges and pointy elements like uh, the tip of the radum, the tip of the aerodynamic surfaces and the leading and the trailing edges. Typically the radiation is actually scattered in different direction, may not be omnidirectional, but definitely it is scattered on a large solid angle and it is definitely that you don't want if you want to preserve stealth. This type of scatter normally happens when the wavelength of the impinging radiation is of the same order of magnitude or up to an order of magnitude smaller than the local curvature. Smaller wavelengths have specular reflection, higher wavelengths are either scattered or um, just not influenced. Particularly important is the, the diffraction from the leading and the trailing edge of the wing because there it happens in a sort of a conical pattern which is named the color cone and the power emitted actually depends on the length of uninterrupted uh, uh, conductive uh, surface that you have on the edge. The longer the uninterrupted conductive surface, the higher is the energy emitted into the color cone. We have seen in the previous video that avoiding vertical surfaces in 90 degrees angles greatly reduces the specular reflection. The concept is reflecting the radiation away from the direction where it is coming from, so you need to avoid vertical surfaces, but you need to have flat surfaces, canted tails, and you need to avoid external stores and pylons. However, even if you do this, this is not enough to avoid surface waves, creeping waves and diffraction. So what can we do for these three? The first reduction measure is designing the plane surfaces, reducing gaps and discontinuities. In practice, this means having panels made of the same materials and having junctions and joints with the same electrical properties of the panels. This is obviously easier said than done. Discontinuities are unavoidable, so something needs to be made to manage them. Fillers made of radar absorbing materials can be used uh, between the panels. It is actually very visible in the F-35 where there are those um, grey strips, various points of the plane, those are additional fillers of radar absorbing materials. When the gaps are necessary and cannot be filled, like for example everywhere you have a hatch, then jack borders reduce the energy emitted by the panel size and they're generally designed in a way to point the color cones of the panel in low priority directions. Also jack panels do have specular reflection toward low priority directions. This is the reason why all stealth planes have this kind of sawtooth appearance that are their typical look. And also notice that the sawtooth actually reduces the distance that the surface wave can travel, so the color cone intensity is actually reduced as well. Leading edges, trailing edges, all the sharp edges, like for example on the intakes, actually cause diffraction. One way of reducing this effect is actually treating the surface, applying a resistive strip where the resistance goes from zero to a very high level and then reduces again. In this way, there is no abrupt 
discontinuity of the electrical properties and the traveling wave is actually absorbed. Another methodology more complex is to make, for example, the entire leading edge of radar absorbing material and then hiding a metal structure with no discontinuities or with a saw tooth as well under the radar absorbing material, but this is obviously structurally more taxing for uh, um, the aircraft design. Actually, the two methodologies are often combined, so on the same plane you find the resistive strips and uh, inserts of radar absorbing materials or parts made of radar absorbing materials, uh, depending on the kind of optimization that the designers do. So this is for the airplane structure, but there are parts of the plane like uh, canopies, uh, nozzles, intakes, that do require some specific solutions. We have seen a lot, but there are some issues that we didn't mention so far. Intakes, canopies and radooms, they all have their own peculiar problems when it comes to stealth. So let's have a look. Yes, let's do it. So, exactly. Air intakes are cavities in the body of the aircraft and cavities in general are powerful radar reflectors. A cavity in the optical domain tends to be dark because light is much more easily absorbed than radar. Even a white wall doesn't reflect 100% of the energy. Radar specular reflection on the contrary and all the other effects that we have already seen in the previous videos actually return quite a high percentage of the impinging energy. The aircraft behaves more like a combination of mirrors than a white wall. However, the effect of the cavity is heavily influenced by the radar wavelength. The frequencies that we consider for stealth usually start in the L band. The L band goes from 1 to 2 GHz for wavelengths from 0.3 to 0.15 meters. This is the typical frequency of the long range surveillance radars. Airborne and ground based surveillance radars normally use the S band. The S band goes from 2 to 4 GHz for wavelengths of a length from 0.15 meters to 0.08 meters. Modern combat planes tend to work with the X band from 8 to 12 gigahertz and wavelengths just a few centimeters. So the intakes behave differently at different wavelengths. With L-band radars, the intake behaves almost as if it was a square plate. The radiation doesn't enter the cavity, so an angled intake just reflects the radiation away from the direction of the emitter. We may want to cover the intake lips with radar absorbing material just to reduce even this type of reflection, but that's basically it. At S-band wavelengths, the ducts on average tend to be of the right size to act as waveguides, so the radiation can actually enter the duct and propagate with minimal energy loss. At the end of the conduit, obviously you have the engine. And the first element of the engine that is met by radiation are the inlet vanes. Their blades usually mobile just in front of the first compressor stage. Since the gap between the vanes is small, much smaller than the typical size of the duct, then the radiation is reflected back along the duct that still acts as a waveguide, so the radiation is actively emitted from the intake. At these frequencies, the intakes will be an important source of radar reflections. The mitigation of this effect is coating the duct with a specifically tuned radar absorbing material, so the energy propagating along the duct is progressively absorbed. With radar working in X-band, the radiation actually enters the intake and bounces geometrically off the duct walls till it reaches the veins. At these, the typical gaps between the veins are the right size to act as a waveguide. It's their turn now. So the radiation is actually transmitted to the compressor. 
so the energy that goes through the veins and reaches the aircraft compressor finds an environment where there are blades rotating with complicated geometries. So what happens is that there is a myriad of reflections and a lot of Doppler shift and basically that energy tend to be absorbed just the minimal part is reflected back. However, the veins themselves do reflect some energy which actually bounces back toward the exit of the duct and is still emitted. May I add something, sir? Chaotis, go on. The three behaviors described with no rigor by Millennium 7 do not have abrupt transitions, but they blend into each other as the radar frequency increases. In particular, the resonant duct frequency will show a peak of re-emitted energy from the intakes. The S-duct main function is not to geometrically screen the engine veins from the radar radiation as often reported on press sources, but to increase the number of reflections. With the help of radar absorbing material, at each reflection a portion of the energy is absorbed, and the cumulated reduction of the re-emitted radiation may be in the order of 50 to 60 decibels. Sir. Otis is right. In aircraft with a straight duct, a lot of energy actually reaches the veins, so it becomes essential to design the veins to reduce the reflected energy, and this is actually placing a constraint of the design of the engine. Redumon, the news of an aircraft, is obviously transparent to radar radiation, because otherwise the aircraft radar could not work. The flip side of this is that the radar antenna is fully exposed. There are unofficial and unconfirmed reports from NATO pilots who say that the large radars used by the MiG-31 or the early uh, members of the uh, flanker family stick out like a sore thumb on the radar. And this is actually not a surprise because the problem is even worse with modern flat antennas. The main mode of reflection is called antenna coupling. That is basically just the reflection of the antenna itself. But since the antenna is an antenna, the reflection will have features similar to the actual radar beam. The emission lobes could be roughly the same. The common solution to this problem is tilting the antenna downwards or upwards a bit to angle the reflection away. However, this solution has the drawback of reducing the effective antenna surface by the cosine of the tilt angle. To be honest, if you are a Russian, you could also use a plasma screen in front of the antenna generated by a specific device that could mask the antenna when the radar is not in use. There is an entire video describing this strange technology available on the channel. Modern AISA radar using a repositioner have already a tilted antenna and the antenna continually rotates so the eventual reflection is actually distributed around. Their general architecture is a mitigating factor in itself. Another reflection mold is called edge diffraction. It is caused by the metallic rim around the antenna and it happens particularly when there is a traveling wave uh, going through it. It is usually mitigated by radar absorbing materials. Canopies are opening into large cavities where reflection at all frequencies may happen. And it is also a cavity where it is difficult to work on the shape to reduce the reflections. The solution that is generally adopted is to screen the cockpit to prevent the radiation from entering into the cavities in the first place. The inner part of the canopy is coated with a very, very thin layer of gold. Gold is an excellent electrical conductor and can be used to create thin layer, I mean micron-sized layer, that appear to the impinging radiation as metal plates. Well, they actually are metal plates, to be honest. In this way, we are preventing the radiation from entering into the cockpit, but we are not preventing the reflection. Moreover, since the canopy is curved, the specular reflection happily sprays around radar returns. So it is necessary to coat the canopy, generally outside this time, with a transparent radar absorbing material. These materials are generally based on a polymeric plastic matrix, 
which, with inclusion of uh, rare metal oxides. Since they are thin and transparent, they can't really be designed to absorb a wide range of frequencies. They tend to be tuned to a particular frequency, which is connected to the size and the shape of the metal oxide particles. To avoid this, you may add more than one layer. For example, the Sukhoi 57 has no less than 10 layers of radar absorbing materials, each one tuned to a different frequency. Cumulative effect is to have an absorption in a wider range of frequencies. So by now it should be clear that Stealth requires the solution of many different problems of different natures and... You did not mention low observable weapons and pylons, sir. Otis is right, we didn't speak about the weapons. We have already mentioned in a previous video how weapons, when they are carried outside under the wing of the plane, they are a powerful radar reflector. This is the reason why all stealth planes carry their weapons in internal bay. However, the weapon themselves can be made stealth, and so can the pylons. Let's be clear, there is no way to even approach the radar cross section that can be obtained in a clean configuration, but well, every bit helps. In fact, the F-35 features the SUU-96 pylon and the LAU-151 rail launcher. These are built and shaped according to the same principles that we have already seen. So even if they do have a small radar cross section, there is no way of hiding the 90 degrees angles that they form with the wing. And that angle itself is in a very powerful radar reflector. While a lot of current weapons still have a circular section, which is probably one of the worst, modern gadget weapons also tend to use the same principles that we have described to make themselves less conspicuous on the enemy's radars. Weapons like the AGM-158 and the European Taurus clearly show the same canted tails, uh, sloped sides and general features that can be identified on stealth planes. So we can definitely see how right stealth is becoming more and more pervasive in this century and it shows no sign of slowing down. This is what we had for today. Thank you very much for watching. Well done, sir. Thank you, Otis. That's very kind of you. Unusual, but very kind. Sir, you just programmed a macro that makes me say well done at the end of a recording session, sir. He's obviously right, I just forgot. See you.